What is up, my fellow Exandrians? My name's Noah. Welcome to Table Ready, and this is The Critical Review, where I critically review all the episodes of Campaign 3 of Critical Role. Now, all of my ratings and reviews should be taken with the same amount of seriousness as the deck of many things being brought up at level 2. Today, I want to get into some things primarily from episode 38, but also 39 that I think are interesting. Let's walk it back a little bit to the beginning of episode 38. The party is fairly successful in separating Delilah from Laudna, enough so that Pike could try to bring her back. The problem is, when the party comes back from this spiritual realm, Pike still senses Delilah inside of Laudna. The party still decides to resurrect her with Vex's go-ahead. This, I think, is important for the story in order for it to move forward, but did seem a little unrealistic, as I don't know if Vex would actually go through the risk of bringing Delilah back, her husband's worst enemy, the person who killed his entire family, minus his sister, for strangers. I don't see that happening. I'd probably give that like a 4 out of 10. That being said, it was still great because I wanted Laudna to come back and was interested to see what would happen next. Matt wasn't pulling any punches here and still made the party make their rolls to see whether or not the spell would take or not. I want to talk about this moment. Pike said that you might not want to come back, so... I'm afraid we can't let you do that. So I'm going to cast Compulsion on her and compel her to come back, if possible. Okay. Now look, I see two different things here. I see what I think the player's intention was and what the character was actually doing in game and what that might imply or, or do that kind of pissed Laura off later. You see, FCG cast the spell command to try to force Laudna to come back. Now, that it might just be Sam trying to uh, avoid or get an automatic success for one of their uh, skill challenges in order to make the DC lower when the spell is cast. But how that's read player to player is different than character to character. Now, because FCG would have to use the verbal component of the spell, it's very likely that Imogen would know what spell FCG was trying to cast and would have been fairly pissed, as you can see here. I'm not going to tell you to come back. I'm not going to try to compel you to come back because that choice, Laudna, is yours now. No one gets to control you anymore. All right? In this, I would have to give uh, Laura a solid 7 out of 10 for kind of putting that foot down and saying, uh-uh, we're not controlling this woman anymore who has been under the influence of others her entire life. That being said, FCG, you get a five. Maybe there is something to be uh, said for you not really understanding some of the human implications of these things, but yeah, that, not not so cool to, to mess with um, autonomy when it comes to coming back from the dead or deciding your ultimate fate. On to the roles in roleplay necessary to help encourage Imogen to come back to the land of the living. I know that I gave Matt props for still making the roles have to happen, but let's be real here. The stakes were fairly low. I mean, the starting DC was 12 and then was lowered by three for a success and only increased by one for a failure, which means one success wipes away all the failures and three successes, I mean, then your DC is what, four? I think someone said, and I'll try to post the comment here because I know I'm going to get it wrong off the top of my head, but they said something along the lines of, I'm sure that the dice rolls are probably just as meaningful or useless as the reasoning for Vox Machina ending up helping them, <laughs> which I thought was astute and brought some levity to the situation for me. It's true, the party already did so much just to get there and had to go through this whole spiritual realm. Making an easier save for the party isn't that consequential and I mean she comes back that's what we all wanted and it would have been a real bummer if the DC was set to like 16 because a bunch of failures happen. I do think the DC probably should have increased by two when the natural one happened though. Next I want to rate Marisha coming back from the dead well I guess Laudna coming back from the dead. I'm gonna give her a 9 out of 10 because I thought that this was near perfect. She came back was confused didn't know what was going on and then when she realized she was in Whitestone that reaction was priceless. Absolute fear and dread 
is what should have happened. She comes back seemingly possibly still connected to Delilah when the doors open and the army is there with Percy holding bad news off in the distant, taking aim. Talk about being on the wrong end of some bad news. <laughs> Am I right? Lana continues to go through this weird set of emotions as the place that she previously knew as a place of dread and darkness and evil now is a beacon of hope and is bright and there are families running around. It's a shock, but she insists on going to see the Sun Tree. There's this touching moment with her and Percy and some of the members of Vox Machina and some of the members of Bell's Hells. I felt like Marisha uh, brought the eeriness and the weirdness and the conflict that comes with being both a citizen of Whitestone and a victim of Whitestone into the same arena. And you could see as Percy and others didn't really know what to make of all of her reactions. Very cool. This moment does bring up a question for me though. Laudna talks about how warm the sun tree was. Does that mean that she now has sensation back that she didn't have before? She exclaims about how it was warm and it makes me think, oh, maybe she's more alive than she was before. But that is immediately followed up with an upgrade to Pate. Pate is now taken on the stats of an imp and is a familiar to Laudna, which means that Laudna's probably got more warlocky stuff going on. And this is a huge question for me. What is happening? Delilah's not gone, so Delilah's still there. Percy wants Delilah gone, how do they make that happen? But that never really even gets addressed this episode. Also, you would expect after a fight like that, Delilah would just take her power back. Remember, this is like a voluntary contract. For real though, take to the comments and let me know why Laudna still has her powers. Not only does she still have her powers, but Delilah was made weaker and Laudna's powers got stronger. I don't know. I'm interested in finding out. But before I go down that rabbit hole, I am going to give an 8 out of 10 for Pate. <laughs> Matt's roleplay of Pate is top notch. I can tell that he really tried to take what Marisha had originally put into Pate and level it up a little bit to give it a little more life. The party now has a creepy, though cute, little animal companion alongside with their construct, which means they basically have all the makings for a Disney movie. They move towards some answers about these divine gates and Thrizdun. Thrizdun was actually the big baddie in the campaign that me and my party just ended. I played Grawl Stonefist, a king, half-orc barbarian who was on a mission to try to destroy Thrizdun's final gateway into the Prime. The campaign was seven years running and finally ended on Hall Halloween just like it started. I gotta say, man, solid 10 out of 10. Shout out to you, Josh. The greatest DM. The amount of appreciation that a DM gets will usually not be outweighed by the amount of tomfoolery and shenanigans they have to deal with from a party, so always feel free to show your DM some love. Moving on. That night, FCG joins Imogen in her dreamscape, and there is a large male figure who walks away into the storm, much like everyone else who has done so in her dreams, who has also died. She believes it's Lord Esteros and tries sending him a message to no avail. There's no response. My heart dropped because, as you all know, Orc Daddy Esteros is my favorite NPC, and I really wish that there had been a little bit more oomph to his death. The good news is, however, Matt lets them skip all the shopping and do it over text message later so that they can move along with the story to go find Estros' body. That gives you a 10 out of 10. Shopping does not need to happen at the table, especially if you know that you're not going directly into a combat scenario. Shout out to you, dog. Upon finding Estros' dead body, Matt kind of uses that as an opportunity to do a fat loot drop, giving them access to his airship and his dope-ass cane. The cane looks like a simple cane, but then extends out to a scythe, which is super badass, and I understand why Ashton and Chetney might be fighting over this item. We'll see who gets it. Now, the rest of episode 39 is fairly uneventful, and I was kind of expecting as much. They just finished a, an arc, essentially, and they're going to be spending time reconciling with the death of Estros and need to figure out where to go next. So I had a feeling that this episode would be 
lax. The episode ends with a lot of stuff going on with the moon while the party is on this airship. Chetney fails a saving throw and then goes all wolf shit on everyone and has to get stopped by the party before returning to normal. Imogen has a nightmare with her mother in it and her mother just tells her to run. And I got one thing to say. Bitch, be more helpful. Stop saying the same thing. Clarify. You only know four words. But anyways, that motivates Imogen to finally cast Sending to her mother, in which she replies, and that's where we end the episode. That's most of what I have for the last two weeks, but I do have a question for you guys. Just something interesting I want to throw out there. I'm wondering if Ashton has cancer. Now, trust me, I know, cancer is no laughing matter, and I'm not making a joke. This comes up not just because there is this mass in the side of Ashton's head, but also because one of the rage types is temporal morass, kind of like a temporal mass, which is obviously on the side of Ashton's head. Temporal, like temporal lobe, and then morass, meaning like fogginess or like something that's obscured, which happened when Ashton lost memory, everything around that time is shaky and jumps around, much like Ashton does when using temporal morass. I don't know, but there could be some depth there. The living in constant pain, the struggle with this chronic illness that may actually be empowering Ashton to find the answers that they need. I think that's really cool, and if you think so too and want to hear more things like this and just kind of like recap some of the episodes with me, then feel free to hit the subscribe button down below and make a mage hand out of the like button. I really appreciate it. It helps me out with the algorithm, which means our channel can grow. I'll see you next time, my fellow Exandrians. Peace.